Hello and welcome to the Xenothesis podcast. My name is Richard Acton and my co-host is... Michael Glinka. Hello, everyone. Okay, uh, so let's uh, dive in. Uh, we're talking about um, Octavia Butler's Xenogenesis trilogy, Book 1, Dawn, Part 1, Womb, Chapter 3. Um, so, uh, would you want to pick up with uh, where we were at last time, Michael? Yeah, um, so the last time we've uh, discussed... Um, two chapters of the book without beginning introduction. I made some prediction for for this chapter. So maybe I should begin with the predictions while I don't to, to this chapter. So I said that this chapter will probably talk about Lilith slowly getting used to Chidaya and until she's ready to leave the the room or the, the sort of the cage she was in. And I said that the moment she's gonna leave the room there's gonna be a massive shock because it's called, she's gonna see how many Aliens are there with humans intermingling with them, and um, Chitaya will show her on the ship. So maybe, and maybe Lilith will meet the alien race leader. That that was mm -hmm. the prediction. <laughs> um, we don't quite get yet to the the leaving the space bit. No, the, no, we don't. That's there. the thing. Like I've, uh, I think I only hit um, the, the the first maybe yes, sort of yes. Uh, yes, but the rest of them were. Meh, I think work. a little bit, a little bit further along in the in in the progression of the book. Yes, yes. Um, but yeah, I don't think we should penalize you over much for having a <laughs> compressed time horizon on when stuff's going to happen. I guess so. I don't know. Maybe I'm used to reading books that have much faster pacing. I don't know that, yeah. uh, but. You know, I'm sure what I predict is going to happen. I just don't know which chapter it's going to happen. No? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to clarify from last time. I think I said um, that Octavia, the author, is was an only child from the age of seven, which is a nonsensical sentence once passed. Um, so she was an only child, and she lost her father at the age of seven, just so that if that weird expression bugged anyone, is clarified and the other thing i wanted to point out was i kind of said that biology is handled less well in sci-fi often than like chemistry and physics and i said it was because biology was kind of i didn't want to imply that it's like more difficult than chemistry and physics i don't want to insult our like chemistry physics colleagues right um but it it's different in the way that it's difficult is kind of what i wanted to say there in that uh, physics and chemistry are more constrained by first principles so you can kind of fact check it more easily whereas biology is um, unpredictable in yes cases. very unpredictable <laughs> relatively speaking um, the sort of rules that define what's possible in the space of biology um, are like a very the actual reality of biology explores a very small portion of what's possible in biology. So it's much more contingent. There's a lot more kind of trivia that you have to know in order for, um, in order to sort of uh, you know, know what's kind of a bit more possible, right? Whereas once you've got some of the like basic math down for some of the physics and chemistry stuff, you can kind of fact check it. Biology, you really have to kind of delve deep because there's always some weird, crazy thing that you weren't expecting that comes up. Um, you have to give it sort of like a margin of error be yeah. before before you actually make any conclusion because mm. any sort of cell biology or any biology will just often there's always behave. an exception yes yeah. yes yeah um in science i think biology has probably more the most outliers hmm. yeah. uh, out there yeah. though don't quote me on that because i might be wrong i, I think it's fair right because of the uh, i mean like ultimately of course it's an extension of physics and chemistry and so on but like it it's yeah, it's inherently dealing with complex systems so it's inherently yeah, unpredictable I, I think, theory and all I that. think yes I think that's the the biggest um thing that with biology is that we constantly work on complex systems mm -hmm. and even though in biology when you do any work on research uh, work um, for out there for those listeners who have never experienced any science work um, we set up hypotheses and often for any work we do we need to um, set up a hypothesis question mm -hmm. what how we want to address a certain interesting um, aspect of biology let's say 
and we often if you want to answer a question you have to always start with the the, the primary building block so ask like reduce the variables as the we call it so yes um, trying to have it maximum one variable at a time where whereas in a complex system often those variables yeah. interact with each other which mm -hmm. is much much difficult to predict mm. in biological systems whereas you know yeah i mean occasionally it's you know it's still true of many physics things like you know there's the old joke about this only works for a spherical cow in a vacuum but um it's it's more so of a problem in biology because there's there's always uncontrolled variables somewhere in there yeah so that's 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 where we are at the moment yes the, the, so that's why we just wanted to clarify that. But mm. in general, we think um, it's for writers, scientific, science fiction writers, mm. I think it might be easier to adapt chemistry and physics, uh, abstract or futuristic as, uh, chemistry and physics compared to biology. Yeah, it's, easy, it's easier to extrapolate to some degree. It's, uh, mm. yeah. But anyway, um, let's actually jump into, into the story, having had that little yes. tangent. Yes, so... Um, I'll be introducing the chapter um, and sort of we got some feedback uh, from our listeners. Um, we thank everyone for doing that and um, we will sort of try to balance and um, answer the biology a bit easier and discuss it in more sort of basic details before we jump into depth in too much depth because as you can tell we're both we're we're both scientists, and we immediately we understand what we're talking about, but yeah, we're kind of forgetting both. that some people may not. So, thank you for the feedback, and let's dive in then. Um, so, in chapter uh, three, um, we um, we've discussed we have the main character Lilith um, struggling to get used to um, Jedi's uh, appearance mm. and presence, um, who refuses to leave her side. And as hard as she's trying to ignore his presence and trying to escape his um, looks, she's unable. Um, at some point, she gives up uh, on sleep and escape him and strikes a conversation about the scar that she received after one of her first awakenings that we've mentioned in previous um, podcasts. Um, she finds out that she had cancer. Chitaya tells her she had a cancer, something prevalent in her family, in fact, uh, which was removed. And I'm saying removed in uh, inverted commas mm. because um, it's very interesting the way he described it. Um, Taya told her that it was done by one of his relatives under supervision of a human physician. Uh, we learn more about we learn more about the relative of Taya, a being that is neither male or a female, but an uloi. That's how uh, it was described. Uloi. Yeah. Um, the way Jedaya described Uloi is that they are capable of understanding the body in its most unique and in-depth meaning. Um, later on, we are hinted that, that they are capable of understanding or even further perceive the genetics in the body of any being. Um, so what actually happened to um, um, Lilith was that... Um, the Uloi removed the cancer to understand its intrinsic genetics and then stimulated Lilith's body to resorb the cancer mm. tissue back again. To, and by resorbing, we mean the body accepted the tissue and it used it as its normal tissue. Mm. And I think this is, before I continue on, I think this is very interesting, the, the whole concept of being capable of understand the genetics and resolving the uh, making the off body to resolve the cancer because we as humans if we have cancer it's well it's very um i mean i suppose we we get a, we get a little bit adjacent to that with attempts at like immunotherapy type stuff uh, stimulating the immune system to attack the cancer it's kind of similar sort of space but we're in the the infancy of that capability yes i mean you know if during cancer what happens in the human body is that our immune system what it does usually is that it detects abnormal cells and starts attacking them you know cells start eating the immune system start to eat those cancer cells 
and this is this is the best case scenario by the way everyone mm. and then that sort of can be acted as a resorption but yeah so that's that's sort of happening all the time right because this the whole um it's this notion of a multi-hit model of cancer wherein um several things have to go wrong several hits have to occur to until a normal cell before yes, it becomes yes. cancerous so a lot of the time the activity of the immune system is against stuff that's not cancerous yet it's kind of precancerous and that's that occurs kind of constantly in us we're always at, uh, sort of at, uh, some stuff is you know they getting adjacent to you know, heading down that path towards becoming a cancerous cell and the immune mm. system intervenes early to stop it from going further and just for our listeners um usually what happens in the human body is that if a cell accumulates a lot of those mistakes in its genetic code uh, what happens it is that the cell um, itself triggers a mechanism that basically causes it to suicide to kill itself mm. and at that point the cell basically is just uh, stimulates the ac- activates the system and the cell starts to break down and that, that's what usually happens in cancer is that that those mutations accumulate so much that that system doesn't trigger and you of uh, and that's the problem yeah. the cell keeps replicating copying itself while maintaining those mistakes in itself and it acquires more and more mistakes and this is what cancer really is mm. uncontrolled replication yes and um sometimes it stays in its place and you can just easily you know you a nice doctor removes this uh, the tumor um and you're given some medications and after that the chemo after chemotherapy you're fine but sometimes the cells decide to float around in your body and then it's much more difficult to fight. Yeah. yeah. Um, although there's kind of a, there's a trade-off between um, having successful self-renewal, right? Having cells that are capable of, of dividing to fix stuff and repair things that are no longer working and the possibility of cancer. So there's a, mm. there's like the, a limit on replication, this, this concept of like the Hayflick limit. So a cell can only divide so many times and that's thought of as like an insurance mechanism to prevent um excessive replication that leads to cancer but it also has kind of a drawback that perhaps that prevents the the, like the long-term repair of of tissue although that um is somewhat contradicted as a theory by um the existence of an animal called the naked mole rat which seems to be kind of you know, kind of, it manages to escape that sort of paradox because it it lives for a super long time, like thirty years, and it's the size of a mouse, which is like ten times longer than you expect for a mouse, but doesn't get cancer. And in fact, it's super hard even to give naked mole rat cells cancer in like culture. It's very hard to to cause them to get cancer. So there clearly are organisms out there that have kind of cracked some of this. I've watched recently a video on, I think, Kurz Gesagt, uh YouTube channel, which I highly recommend to everyone. This is not sponsored. Honestly, <laughs> anybody who's interested in science, watch it, like, 100%. And it was about the cancer as well, about in cancer in big animals, like whales, elephants, like... Um, because obviously <laughs> every animal gets cancer. Every being gets a cancer and multi... Uh, multicellular uh, uh, organs gets cancer. If you look at trees, sometimes you can see those sort of growths on the side. These are cancer. Obviously, the tree is not going to die for the next 80, 100 years because, you know, trees grow very long. It takes a long time to grow and anything will happen. But it's still a cancer. So there was a theory um, on that video talking about um, what happens in big animals. Like why big animals, you, you don't see many cases of animals dying of cancer, big animals dying of cancer. And it might be the case uh, because the cell size stays the same, mm. right? Um, yeah. So technically, the amount of times of the cancer occurring in the body should be much higher because the amount of cells is much bigger, yep. uh, larger. So the probability of those cells becoming cancerous should be much higher. And what and what the, one of the theories was basically saying that this took, those animals get cancers, probably cancer all the time, to get cancerous uh, cells all the time. Mm. But those cancers get their own cancer that kills them. 
So <laughs> there's like a basically a system that says develop cancer, and then there's another cancer that starts to develop because it takes so long for those cells to actually have any effect on the body that those cancers become so cancerous they kill the cancer on cell uh, by itself. So. Oh, it's an it's, interesting theory. I'm not sure I'm entirely convinced by that notion. That's, I, I, yeah. To be honest, I, I, you know what? I'll maybe for the next uh, recording, I'll dig out where the references were mm. the, uh, where the, they based that theory, uh, theory on. Mm. Um, but um, I found this really interesting that because uh, it, it sounds like something that it's possible that if something... Mm. I think there was a case of a human case uh, sometime a year ago, maybe. Oh, I mean, there, there have been, I think it was uh, some kind of leukemia case that had... An effectively analogous effect to like two different types of leukemia that more or less cancelled one another out. Yeah, I, th I think this is kind of uh, not a terribly reliable mechanism, so I don't think that would work terribly No, well I wouldn't for... count that, oh, I hope to get cancer on my cancer so it kills the cancer. Yeah, I mean, it that's... seems... It, yeah. It, <laughs> I'm not sure the the statistics seem would work out in favor of that functioning consistently. Yeah, I mean, unless like, you're the luckiest person out there in the hmm. universe. I mean, otherwise, I wouldn't count <laughs> on that. Yeah. Uh, trust your trust your doctors, you know, and the modern uh, medications. Hmm. They, they do work. They, honestly, they do. Yeah, uh, they're, they're improving. Oh yeah, they are constantly improving. That's yeah. I, I would I trust. I would trust uh, doctors more than I would trust um, well, yeah. my own body to create another cancer to kill yes. the cancer. Yeah, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and never take any medical advice from either of us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we are, even though we are, well, one of us at the most recording is a doctor, but none of us are the medical doctors who so do not take any health advice from us. Get Go to the specialist. But anyway, maybe let's move on. Um, so I think there was we had a point about um, Steyer referring to the the Uloi relative as it. Um, yes, yes, it, it, she does. Uh, in my notes, I wrote they because hmm. it was sort of you know. I thought it was a, an interesting sort of writing choice. It seems almost um, well, yeah, the, the analog of dehumanizing for these Owen Carly, uh, but it, it puts the Uloi in a. A sort of lesser position, more an object, um, and I'm wondering if that's, in some sense, a deliberate a thing on behalf of the author, author kind of rendering the the Uloi a bit more other, um, a bit more inhuman to to Lilith. Well, the question is actually because Chitaya, when he introduces himself and asks, when she asks him what he is, he sort of says he's sort of an equivalent of a human male. Hmm. I think Lilith is sort of with that answer immediately assuming that what those beings are, they have males and females. Mm. But in fact, um, what we learn is that those later on, if after we will discuss later, but they talk about that those families actually are made of three sort of parents, like the male, female, and Uloi. Mm. So, in fact, it may not make sense in our minds, in her mind especially, um, but, you know, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen hmm. in a way. So, uh, I don't know. I, I, I just, I feel to me, it, for me, that it might be that, um, considering the age that book was written and the time, um, many aspects of life still were not... Um, and the position of male and females, you know, in the family were pretty um, still at the time, and they still are, but um, defined what what they are, how they look, and you know how. Um... Yeah, it's sort of making uh, some degree of gender role assumptions there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, well, I think this is something. Maybe I mean, if. In reality, if she called it, I mean, she could. The it could indicate anything, including Chitaya, because mm. honestly, at the moment, we can't really deduce what sort of, in terms of perspective or human perspective mm. or the Earth mammalian perspective, um, you know, males and females are basics of how we reproduce. Mm. So. But in reality, we don't know how they exactly re reproduce exactly. Yeah, we don't, don't yet know what what their whole uh, system is. 
um, so we can't assume at the moment. So indeed. I think I think we should keep this in mind. Yes, for future. yeah. Keep an eye on exactly how their reproduction works. Um, so I was wondering, what did you make of the? Um, uh, so when when uh, Staya is describing the Uloi's kind of investigations of the humans. Lilith, she wanders. Her mind goes to some quite dark places as to what exactly the Kohankali might be doing. Um, did you make of anything of that? Um, I, I think I focus on other things mm-hmm. about the Uloi, so I haven't actually thought about it. But um, is there anything on your mind? Well, yeah. So there's a, there's a particular quote that she she said uh, she imagined treatable diseases being allowed to run their grisly course in order for the Uloi to learn. When Steyer says, you know, the Aloy are studying the human, she kind of goes, you know, she thinks about all the things they might be doing to them. And that uh, that particular line put me in mind of the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, it does sound really... I mean, you know, honestly, it's examples of people running before any sort of regulations, before, you know, that experiment, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, or... Um, even though it happened, what when it happened? It was it was uh, it ran from thirty two to seventy two, I think, if memory serves, which is ridiculous given that. Um, so perhaps I should provide the context there. So the Tuskegee syphilis experiment was a prospective study of um, the uh, like the life course. What happens if you're infected with syphilis? Exactly how it kind of kills you and and. You know, the pathology of the disease, but it was run in um, in African American men in uh, I forget which state, like Mississippi, Alabama, I want to say somewhere down in the south. And treatment for syphilis was developed in the forties with penicillin, but it kept running long after they could have treated these people, and so they just they just left them with the disease for a really long time. Um, and it was a massive scandal at the time. It all came out in, in 72, 73. Um, so I think it would have been in the zeitgeist when um, a little bit of, you know, when, when Octavia was kind of uh, growing up. Uh, so it's... Yeah, that's yeah. it's it's such a messed up thing when you think about it because mm. for our listeners, um, during the Second World War, Germans performed a lot of horrendous experiments, human experiments, and during the Nuremberg Nuremberg, 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 yeah, 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 trials, it came out to light what was happening, and based on that trial, that trial basically, there were some rules, ethical rules being mm-hmm. introduced against any human sort of testing without, you know, so there's like sort of first ethical um ru- ru- like rules, and yet. And this was Second World War we're talking about, and mm. yet this is this was happening in America still. Yeah. And this after this that. spurred a lot of uh, reforms in the whole sort of um, experimental ethics oversight for human subjects and so on. There's a bunch yes. of organizations that um, were kind of founded effectively as a result of the investigation into this this study. It's it's pretty infamous. Um, yeah, I, I think this is uh, this is what I think people don't realize that. Um, well, I'm sure people realize, but like the aspect that nowadays any human trials are very strictly regulated. Mm. Before any experiments on humans are performed, they, there has to be a lot of prior studies to do, uh, done with peer-reviewed publications ready and clear that there might be some positive effect for humans to be used. So, but even then, even then, my dear listeners, it happens. Do you remember, Richard, the name of the medications given to pregnant women for, against the oh, morning uh, sickness? Oh, the thalidomide thing, yeah. Yes, mm. yes, which co- which wasn't properly tested, was mm. given to women, pregnant women, and that, even though it might have helped women, but it had awful um, yeah that that she comes back to some of the science we were discussing last week the whole chirality thing because what went wrong there was the um one isomer of the thalidomide drug is safe the other one is not the synthesis process didn't um separate the two in uh, so that they weren't aware that the other isomer was a problem and they had a mixture, you know, a racemic mixture of the, the two different isomers that were using in the production drug. So whilst they knew one of them was safe, they did uh, 
not have that information about the other compound, the isomer. Yeah. yeah. So mistakes do happen, but if the mistakes happen, the, a lot of people pay a lot. So at the moment, there's a lot of things that honestly before any human trials nowadays will happen there's a lot of things that need to be tested mm. and observed before anything of such thing may occur um so yeah i mean it's it's uh, i hope that that uloi did not run things like that on humans mm. but well, the, the implication is that they didn't need to right the yeah, whole, they, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. They have yeah. this this perceptual ability of genetics that we'll we'll probably get onto. I, I thought it was it was interesting that uh, Lilith immediately went to like super dark human experimentation oh, yeah. stuff. Uh, to be honest, I mean, being in the isolation for so long, who bloody knows what was happening? Yeah, so I, I can totally imagine. Though. Yeah, but yeah, but I think let's move on to the continuing to describe the chapter and um, yes, and move on. So. The next, the story continues with Lilith acclimatizing to Chitaya and when he offers her food and she realized that uh, he has a hand like ours, but it looks like a daisy, looking like a daisy mm. with many fingers around the palm. And we are told that she imagined herself around so many beings like him and that made her feel, immediately feel like a panning attack or as she described, a true xenophobia. She's like, clearly still very... Uh, like viscerally scared of him. Yes, I mean, yeah. you know, it's it's different, different. The constant new things that she's learning about him, the new mm. differences. I mean, obviously, it's it it feels like she is under under constant sort of vigilance of what what new, what different, strange things may happen. Yeah, I said there's a quote. There's a she could not remember ever having been so continually afraid, so out of control of her emotions. Jedi had done nothing, yet she cowered. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that later on. Mm. And we learn that um, the name of the beings that the alien race that Taya belongs to, Onkali, is that the correct pronunciation? I believe so, yeah, Onkali. Yeah. Uh, which means meaning many things, but one of them being traders. Uh, when prompted to explain what they trade, Taya answers ourselves with no further explanation. We also learn about Taya's past. He was given to a human doctor to learn to do his work. Uh, the human was too old to have her own children, but she could teach, and that's what she did. She was dying due to old age, even though her lifespan was uh, expanded by the Onkali to the ripe age of 113 years. And um, Taya talks about that human physician as, her, as his fourth parent. Um, and we are then told that Lilith was originally the age of 26 pro prior to her being captured by the aliens mm -hmm. and even though 250 years have passed the stasis she was kept under uh, only made her age by two years and that she will live much much longer um, and her children as well yeah. will live really I'm not sure long. if it's implied that the the stasis means she only uh, aged two years, or if she aged not at all in the stasis, and the two years was the time she spent awake in various increments. Um, I think it's the second. It's the yeah. second that what's the, the case. The stasis prevent her to age, whereas the, when she was awake, only two years have actually passed in her in the human uh, uh, in the Earth years. Yeah, subjective and time, as it were. Yeah, we are told that she will stay biologically young meaning that she will probably age much, much slower. And uh, But when she learns that she spent two years of her life in solitary, uh, Lilith wonder what the aliens would possibly give her to return those years to her. I mean, technically she was under, you know, supervision or in, in capture for 250 years, but... Yeah, no, it's just two subjective years, right? So Yeah, yeah. The moment she thinks of that, to the, that idea that how will they pay back those two years to her, uh, we observe a change in Chitaya, um described as his tentacles solidifying that made Lilith less scared of him and made her try to approach him. And um, we found that through approach that Lilith touched him uh, after touching his skin, we find it, that it's smooth and hard like a nail. 
and that the solidification of the tentacles feels unnatural to Chitaya, hmm. muffling his sense, but also representing pleasure and um, or amusement. And when asked, when Lilith asked about why is he being happy, he answered that he was, uh, it was because um, she wanted her time back and not wanted to die. Hmm. Um, he tells her her desire to live is stronger and suggests that it will be tested. Feeling that ominous. being a bit ominous, <laughs> yeah. in my opinion, um, and alarmed, rightly so, Lilith mm. wants to know more, but the only answer she gets is that while she's ready to leave the room, Daya will answer all her questions. Yeah. Um, and I think at that point she's kind of... Um, she wants... To get used to Shdaya. Uh, she's actually kind of annoyed at herself that she can't like control herself around him. She's she wants to like she wants the answers to her questions. So mm. she wants to be able to not be like you know having this kind of physical reaction to being around him all the time, so she can get out there and, and find out what the hell's going on. So she's kind of. But then when he says, "Oh." She will be tested. I that doesn't help. I mean, it's... yes, I mean, the, she's definitely still very apprehensive. <laughs> but um, I think I she's to give had it enough to him. of this he's room. He's honest. He's honest, but hmm. still, I think before I would want. I personally would also want to know everything. Hmm. Yeah, uh, so the, ahead of he's time. honest, but he's very selective with the information with which he's honest. Yes, That's, yes, seems to be the way they function, right? They. they don't seem to be overly big on misleading you. They're pretty upfront, but they're also very cagey about anything they don't want you to know. Uh, they just don't respond if you ask a question they don't want to answer. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's not, I think, ideal um, way to sort of help person to relax. I yeah, mean, as like Lilith says that, doesn't she? It's like, if you knew anything about human psychology, you would not be answering my questions like this, because yeah. it's just I, I'm imagining the worst here. Yeah. Uh, I feel like maybe sometimes a bit of a lie would probably be better than or at least uh, just a gentle sort of, instead of I mean, you know, he, he was supposed to live with a uh, human physicist, and you would think that he would learn how to answer those questions because this is what he was training for to talk to um, human humans but... physician right i suppose yeah physicist. sorry yeah physician sorry yeah. this is a physicist apologies mm -hmm. physician um but <laughs> i think you know as all humans some of them also don't know <laughs> how to properly um performs you know talk or like just hmm. behave in certain situations so might have been a quirk that also that that, that lady had but goodness. yeah and i imagine it takes a while to understand the kind of nuances of social interaction among a very alien species right that picking hmm. up on the, the minutiae of that's difficult as you say for many humans let alone an alien I thought I see on your notes um, your talk. You talked about exposure therapy. Would you like to discuss that? Oh yeah, detail? yeah. On that. Um, so, um, well, so effectively, it seems like Steyer is kind of forcing Lilith into exposure therapy to him in order to get her used to, you know, the, the other Owen Carly. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't really have a great deal to say about the specifics of that, other than yeah, it's just sort of she's like being coerced into getting used to them. Um, through being forced to experience them. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's exposure to anything over time sort of um, gets everyone used to things. But then there's also the idea of a Stockholm Syndrome hmm. when somebody under a distress actually starts to perceive the kidnapper or you know, as a... Um, in a positive light. They, they get attached to them, so... Yeah, we don't see yeah. it here. Suppose, we don't see in this and here, yeah, but uh, yeah, I suppose forced exposure therapy could be a euphemism for Stockholm syndrome. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, she doesn't really have much choice in any of this. Um, mm, true, but to be honest, I I think the the, the relationship of Chitayo and the the human doctor, I think this is fascinating that hmm. um they that that this sort of happened that. A doctor, a human 
I mean, elderly people, mm -hmm. well, I'm maybe generalizing, usually are more accept. Those I've met so f those I've met so far have been much more accepting than you know, what in people may think. But it feels to me that the doctor was really um, helping uh, Taya to understand the humans, and I see. Um, you made some notes about what Lilith said to Chitaya. When Lilith says, you seem too human sometimes. Oh, if yes. I weren't looking at you, I'd assume you were a man. And Chitaya responds, my family gave me the human so that I could learn to do this The work. connection there between the appearance of being human and the being given to the Doctor. I was wondering if you read anything into into that about the the shape, sort of the physical shape of Steyr, because it, it it seemed almost to me to be implying that he looks human because he was like partially raised by a human. Oh, so you mean that like his? Do you think like his form was sort of changed more to look like human-like, or do you mean like that he took a form, he molded himself more to be like a human? To uh, um, do, are you implying that? Well, it's something along those lines. I was wondering if you if you felt the text was implying that. That was what my... Uh, I yeah. don't know. For me, yeah. I think it was more of the um, psychological understanding of humans, mm. not physical. Mm. Um, although, maybe you're right. Maybe it is also implies that he, he, was, he changed his form a bit to be more like humans. Um... But then, you know, obviously you couldn't, if, if you can change the form, why don't you make yourself, giving yourself two fake eyes and nose and the mouth? Yeah. So that the this... face looks, uh, you know, like a human face, while you can sense, use the, use the sensory organs on his body to sense everything. You know, Again, it's... it's it's kind of an Uncanny Valley thing, right? He's a little bit too close from a distance. But when you actually, mm. like, see him in the light, he's, you know, this mass of tentacles that's like a sea slug according to the, the description yeah so, yeah uh, like it would be a, a pretty serious shock right you got the silhouette of a man and then like yeah sea slug yeah it's <laughs> so not, so not helping this is the, so what the thing is he does say to her that um when the human doctor joined uh his family for the first time his family members actually found the human disturbing too very disturbing in the beginning hmm. they found it disturbing in a very interesting way though which i, I thought was worth pointing out mm -hmm. um do you want to give us the quote it was her genetic structure that disturbed them i, c I can't explain that to you you'll never sense it as we do and I think this is very um, interesting because um, I'll continue on with the finishing the chapter introduction because it actually goes into more detail about this mm. and we can discuss it. So in here, um, the chapter ends on the note that Lilith is realizing that it's the slug-like appearance that disturbs her. And when she said that she's getting tired of her reaction to Daya tells her that his household also had a similar reaction to the human doctor when she first joined. The problem was with her genetic structure, that's what he said. Too difficult to explain because humans will never able to sense it as the Onkali do. And the last note is on Chitaya approaching Lilith, reaching to her with his hand, and with his some hesita hesitation, Lilith takes it. And once she does, he says that this room will soon be but a memory for her. And this is where the chapter ended. Mm -hmm. And this is where I wanted to talk about the whole aspect of the... Um, I, I think this is the biggest part of the science, biology that we are given insight into um, yeah. in, in this chapter. Because we find that the Onkali, especially the Uloi, yeah. is capable of um, detecting the genetic structure. And, this, and not just them, but it seems that all Onkali can sort of detect the, the genetics, perceive the genetic hmm. structure of a being. Yeah. And they, that it disturbed them. Hmm. They have some, some, way some kind of perceptual organ that lets them, quote unquote, see the genetics of yes. Uh, yes. You know, other organisms, uh, which is uh, you know, a fascinating conceit for the, uh, the sci-fi. Um, yeah, I mean, this is something... 
we will get to this in the details in a second, but I mm. think for all our listeners, this is something that I I think try I think is the most interesting because, as you may understand, as you all, uh, as our listeners realize that is that when you look, smell, taste, touch, anything that you can sense in a way, mm. it's so natural for us, and it's also natural for them to perceive other beings, their genetic. Um, sequence and it's 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 fascinating and it said that uh, it's what said what the chapter said also that unkali can modify that genetic um sequence as we as was shown when mm. lilith had the cancer growth uh that was resolved into her body again once the unkali yeah. uh Although, sorry but the uloi um yeah um modified I suppose it. it it's not strictly stated that they can modify the the sequence or that the, the uloi modified the sequence there it's just that it chemically induced her body to reabsorb the cancer. So I don't think they necessarily, we don't explicitly get, they like edited the genetics there. Um, that That is correct. But I just wondered whether it's just that, hmm. you know, and I think maybe, I think I have some theories behind it. Mm-hmm. So um, I just wanted to say that um, in our bodies, to all listeners, um we have these cytokines they're called cytokines they're basically proteins that are used by uh don't have to be proteins they can be just molecules let's say molecules that can uh, that stimulate cells so some one cell will release those cytokines those molecules and it will affect the surrounding cells to do something let's say so for example yeah. if you cut yourself so there's the cells on your skin that will lead other cells by releasing the cytokines to start moving and closing that wound. That's what very general hmm. mean describes. So this is what Richard, I think, was mentioning about that the leading the body to sort of by releasing some molecules to stimulate yeah. the body to using to take the cancer to use that cells to break them down, I guess, and yeah. absorb them. Signaling mechanisms that are kind of you know, present in our, our body that tell cells to keep being the kind of cell they are or to start and a, doing a wound repair process or whatever, you know the 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 non genetic kind of ongoing signaling processes that that take place. Uh, it seems to be implied that that was kind of the mechanisms that the Uloi employed, rather than necessarily genetic editing. But in the same time, I thought maybe it does actually have something to do with the genetic. Um, it, it could well do. Yeah. Um, sequencing because. Um, they do talk about understand like the, the genetic structure disturbed them. Yeah, yeah. Meaning they definitely that they, the perceptual capability. Yeah, to understand what the, what was happening there and in in our genome. And I just thought that to, for our listeners to um, to sort of give a brief understanding what ge- genetic sequencing is in our modern world. Hmm. So, should, should I uh, talk a little bit about the structure of DNA? to start yes, with. Yes, please. If you could please yeah. introduce that and then we'll go into mm. the sequencing yeah. afterwards. So, because like, the, the kind of common present in the culture pictures that people have of DNA tends to be, you've got like a spiral, kind of ladder-shaped spiral, right? You know, And then you've mm. got like the sequence of A's, T's, G's and C's, little letters, and then maybe you've got some kind of vague impression of like complicated chemical structure, right? But um, just want to talk a little bit about the that spiral structure, right? So that... Um, just to explain the kind of components of it to because it helps to if you have a better mental model of what the structure looks like you can really reason more effectively about how the sequencing technology works because it kind of follows pretty naturally from it so the the rungs of that ladder on the spiral are the base pairs right in fact that mm, spiral yes. is you know it's two dna molecules whenever you see the spiral represented right each strand like if you took the the equivalent of the sides of the ladder and pulled and each of the rungs split in two then you'd have two strands of DNA, two pieces of DNA. And each of those has that you know, ATGC sequence on them. And each ATG and C is composed of kind of three bits, right? You've got the actual base bit that does the, the pairing behavior where the A only matches up with a T or the G with a C or whatever. Um, and then you've got the backbone bit, the bit that holds together, the kind of the sides of the ladder. And those are comprised of a sugar. Um, it's a you can think of it as like a pentagon shape, right? The sugar. And then you've got a, a phosphate. So it's like a spherical thing, right? So you've got these kind of flat bases. You've got like a 
pentagon for your phosphate. I mean, for your um, sugar, and then a little sphere for the for the um, phosphate, right? And you stack them on top of one another um, to create that ladder or that or one strand of that ladder. But the um, another important feature of it is that there's directionality to the ladder, right? So e- effectively, each side of the ladder points in a different direction. Right. Yes. So if you go back to that, that thing about the little pentagonal things for the sugar, right? If you imagine stacking up a bunch of pentagons on top of one another, they they have an asymmetry, right? So there's one pointy end and there's a flat end. Right? So when you stack them up, they point in a direction, right? So you picture like a pile of pentagons, one on top of the other. One pointing, pointing upwards. Let's imagine if the ladder is going up and down. Yeah, so you've got like an, face. effectively got an, a, a ladder with a bunch of up arrows on one side and a bunch of down arrows on the other side, and that's uh, the jargon is like five prime and three prime, and that refers to the the carbons in the sugar. Um, so you know, there's this this direction of five to three, and that's, or three to five, and that's the the way the pentagons are pointing. Just to so you know, everyone, the five and three indicate the the. Um... The number of carbons inside that sugar ring um, to which the other sugar ring is connected to and mm. from so it starts from five and then goes to three that that's what it means is if you number them in clockwise you basically take that number and then you just pick the number five and then you just go upwards to three and stuff like that so it's just that yeah so it's like counting around the pentagon right? yes uh, except there's an extra little bit on the side which is where the five is but the um uh so to, so to sum that up, you've got these, you know, you've got that, that ladder shape, you've got the rungs that are the bases that are the A, T, G, and C, and the, the sides of the ladder have arrows, one pointing up, one pointing down. Um, right. So when you, uh, if, if you like peel that apart, and you've now got one strand of the ladder, um, sequencing uh, or, or synthesis of the DNA, you, what, you, what you end up doing is you have an enzyme that kind of wraps around a piece of that strand, and there are these free-floating versions of those same bases. Right? So that same, you've got the, the flat thing, which is your nucleotide, your pentagon, and then the phosphate group. But instead of just having one phosphate group, there are three, right? It's called a charged version of the, the nucleotide. Right? It, it needs energy to do anything. So exactly. in, any, in any cell, you need energy. And the source of energy in our bodies is the three phosphate connected together. You know, you hear that concept of the a battery, right? So ATP is often referenced in that context, which is just one of the bases, right? And it's used uh, cleaving off either one or two of those phosphates yields a little bit of energy, which you can use to do something enzymatically. Um, but in the particular case of DNA synthesis, any of the bases, ATG or C, with the three phosphates, each time one of them enters the enzyme that's kind of doing the elongation and matches up, so you know, if there's a T sat on the enzyme in the strand that you're trying to copy, an A ends up in the slot and it fits well, and that lets the enzyme uh, cleave off two of those phosphate groups and incorporate it, add it to the the existing strand. So the the three prime end, the like pointy end of that phosphate, uh, so pointy end of that um, ribose rather, the, the sugar. That's the three prime end, right? So mm-hmm. you, the phosphate group in the the base that's going to be incorporated there's a little chemical reaction it's a nucleophilic attack of the hydroxyl group on the three prime end onto the um the phosphate and that adds a covalent bond in there connects the the base to the to the new strand opposite the the one we're copying and uh, you know, so you and get so on. this molecule basically running up or down the yeah. path mm-hmm. of the ladder and yeah. just the bases just go pew, 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 and then just the energy is released while the bases are being added. added That's basically yeah. so you've got the one strand. This thing kind of slides along it, and every time the right base pairs up, it does that little chemical reaction, and you create a copy of the strand as you move along. Yeah. Um, That's basics, basically, of the DNA. Yeah. That's the DNA synthesis. Yeah. Um, and that is. The fundamental stuff that underlies all of the sequencing technologies that we use uh, in one moment. way or another. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, um, in what scientists came up with, I, the idea was to modify those um, bases, those um, that with the phosphate, to have an extra molecule added to it, um, 
basically in any sequencing you have um, later on you uh, in the references I'll provide a link to a PDF file that reviews all of them there's there's many many there's a nice but little that, summary video we might want to attach as well um, yeah um, basically we'll add some uh, references but basically references. the basic general concept for sequencing and at the moment is science um, involves having those bases with the special molecule that once it attaches to the DNA, that piece of the strand that we are interested in, it will shine light. Basically, a bit of light will be emitted, especially a photon will be emitted. And a very good, very, uh, very good camera will pick up those, um, those little shines of light, basically. Hmm. And the computer will calculate that sort of that that shining of the light as a attachment of base, right? So what happens is like this: you have those DNA pieces attached to whatever a chip or something, and the machine basically what it does is flushes in like a com mixture of the A bases with that with that molecule and then it flashes it out and then and the camera once the command it takes the picture of whatever there was the flashes of light then it cleans it and then another one the c let's say for uh, comes in and then some other dna molecules will shine and the camera just takes all that data and the computer stores that data and basically says okay so these these molecules have the sequence they they shined light on the first when the a was so they have a there then they didn't shine anything until the a came back again and that was a again and and it continues like that so in this way we can understand um sort of the sequence of the dna yeah you can you can infer from from when you get a flash and which bases were available to let the uh incorporation of the next nucleotide uh take place yes um what the base was at that position exactly so yeah. with knowing that we can sequence the dna and know what's the mm. sequence of rna this is sort of the basis of what um frederick sangers in 1977 did and received nobel prize indeed for. yeah and this was the first time where the human uh, genome was sequenced mm. and it that method was used for 40 or more years until a bit better methods appeared yeah. i mean there are a um, couple of different variants like the original uh, the same method doesn't necessarily make use of fluorescence it can make use of length but uh yeah, the the slightly more modernized version of Sanger's method also includes the the fluorescent labeling as well as uh, length of the fragment. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, this is more going to detail of what sequencing yeah. is, which yeah, is a bit more complicated deep. than that. And I hmm. think we should maybe steer away from it. Yeah, unless somebody's to interested too deep in that. I mean, the, the um, only thing that I think uh, is is worth kind of bringing up in relation to the like the Owen Carley perceptual organ. Yes. Right? So now, now we've talked about the the DNA and how the elongation works and how we sequence stuff. Think about how it is that you might have that as a as a sense, right? How would you be able to perceive DNA sequence? Um, mm. And there, there are a couple of sequencing technologies that make use not of fluorescence, but of um, effect, the, the, the products that are evolved from the sequencing reaction. So when you add the base that's got those three phosphates on it, the, the two remaining phosphates and a hydrogen ion are released. And there are two... A hydrogen two ion is just a proton. Just a proton, Just so yeah. everybody know. Yeah. Um, and so we have a couple of sequencing technologies, one called pyrosequencing, two phosphate groups like that. It's called pyrophosphate. Um, so it's basically a system that, that takes that and converts it via an enzyme into an emission of light. And then we have ion torrent sequencing, which detects the the protons on a on a silicon chip and it converts them to electrical current. So those are the two sequencing technologies that I think would be most analogous to whatever perceptual system you had to look at um, uh, DNA. And the reason for that is that ultimately what you'd have to do is convert the the sequence of bases into some kind of electrical impulse so you could interface it with a nervous system right you want your you know you want your neurons to fire when you're seeing a, a particular base sequence as it were 
Yeah, so I think, um, I agree. So I think this is what um, potentially may ha be happening in the Uloi, where they, they, they have these sort of organs, they grab a bit of tissue from a human, it doesn't have to be much, and they are capable of using that sort of method maybe to detect. The only problem I think is that, that the idea, uh, the I can understand it. Yeah, that's where it gets interesting, right? Uh, how, how exactly would you uh, perceive that? But I suppose it would be somewhat analogous to to vision um, in that you know, we get a really complicated set of information that comes into our eyes and built into our retinas is a bunch of effectively image pre-processing hardware and then we have a whole bunch of other stuff in our um, you know, visual cortices that, that process all that information and translate it into something that's you know subjectively comprehensible there's a lot of kind of um, you know heuristics right a lot of summaries to give impressions so that you know when you see something move rapidly out the corner of your eye that catches your attention so I imagine it would be kind of similar right to having uh a visual impression or like the smell of something you'd have this internal kind of ability to intuit meaningful information from that genetic sequence but without necessarily being explicitly aware of the raw signal in the same way that we're not like aware of the individual uh, retina cells like firing in our eyes you yeah. you might be correct but the thing is what we need to remember from our previous recording discussion um is that those aliens possibly have completely different genetic structure indeed yeah. so the question now is them being disturbed maybe it's not being disturbed because it's whatever genes we have but more it's like that the idea that the um the whatever the basis or whatever we you we have are completely mm. different to what they have so for example the dna in us right the, mm. the way we code for proteins or anything the mm. every three bases atc blah 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 um i use as a sort of a um code for one amino acid to make a protein so in their case, it might be more, etc. So that might be the what disturbed them that it's different, that like that that whole concept behind it. And yet, the uloi that you know takes they can understand that uh, mm. that genetic code. They are still capable of sequencing and then understanding, though, even though it's so foreign to that's, them. Uh, okay, that's an interesting interpretation of it. Yeah. So I I think personally, this is something that even though um they're capable of sort of seeing but like mm. the uloi are specialized to understand it more yes and in, in a way right. and I, I and i'm really curious on how how can one understand something so far but then then again it's like learning a new language mm. Because, you know, in binary, 1001, zero, zero, one, like this is what all the computers are working. They're just rapidly sending those on and off switches, one and zero. Hmm. And we are still capable of converting those uh, one and zeros to languages and write programs. And nowadays, there are so many different programming languages that we can convert those signals from. Might be the same, similar, that instead of, you know, when one and zero, we have four numbers and they have, maybe we have more, maybe less, who knows? Hmm. But they're okay, still yeah, capable yeah, of sort of mm. making those translation, let's mm. say, of the of the code. Yeah. My initial impression was that effectively this is assuming quite a lot of biological similarity, and that basically kind of implying that we have the same like protein coding kind of basics as the Owen Carly do, um, because well, I mean, not necessarily, but the the. It seems to me that the thing that's disturbing to them is not what, like, not sort of fundamentally, it's not like they're confused by it or they're not, um, like, struggling to understand it. It's like it has disturbing implications, right? They, it's like they've seen something in the genetics of the humans that they find concerning. Oh, huh, that's interesting. Weird. I actually haven't thought about it. Like, do you think yeah. that would be disturbing for making people, I don't know, using that genetic code for something it's like creating weapons or something do you, do um, you well or... um, perhaps probably not 
weapons as such. But I mean, there is that whole thing when um, uh, the Uloi is reacting to her cancer, and he's like, "You have a talent for cancer." And Lilith was like, mm, "I wouldn't really call it a talent." Um, and then there's the whole thing where it's like it, the Uloi also says the cancer is beautiful in some sense uh, and like there's this kind of unrealized human potential um so that that kind of implied to me that they had they understood the basics and were concerned about higher level stuff mm. it's it's i think this is i mean this is a great conversation to have and i, I think we, we could go on for forever about this because this is i mean as she described, we probably, as Chitaya said, we probably will never be able to perceive how they perceive, and mm. um, and it's true. But I wonder, I wonder, because in the language when Chitaya says that they they think of themselves as traders and they trade themselves, mm. so I just wonder whether they, when the when they trade themselves, they absorb some of the information from other species, because we know that from the other chapter that the the race of Chitaya mm -hmm. has observed many different races to you know commit suicide and they've studied many well great suicide we call them but basically their wars and killing each other and stuff yeah. like that so we know that they observe many races before but I just wonder whether um that idea like maybe they have absorbed or understood so many different types of organisms that are in the universe that maybe um the idea they, they, they can understand more you know what i mean like because they've hmm. they I encountered so many different different, oh, yeah, different things yeah. that there may be yeah. that there's similarities between now hmm. for them hmm. in I humans mean, to, to me part of the reason that um i was thinking about you know that this implies kind of higher level stuff rather than like misunderstanding of the the basics was that i was kind of assuming some limitations of their um ability to like intuitively understand something that was really alien right mm -hmm. so if the fundamental like information encoding system was different then how would you have like a high level heuristic impression of the genetics kind of you know in your like in a dna vision cortex whatever the equivalent is for the like the visual cortex right so those those patterns wouldn't work if you had different like uh, it, they wouldn't be calibrated right um, for I just, a different you, you genetics. You said that. I just imagine, like you know, when people were taking acid or LSD, and just basically the vision completely disturbed. I said, no, yeah. I just imagine it like being like that. That basically them looking at us is just like, mm. what is happening? And it was <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and like, so, but your your point there about you know they've they may have like integrated the genetics of many other species and so on. Maybe they're better equipped to handle that than I think, and maybe they could be more different um than um like there the, the could be you know less biological similarity at the fundamental level and they just have more experience of different systems i guess um, so. so i guess yeah. so I, I feel like maybe it's down to that that being able it, it's it's like in real world right if you go and travel around you experience more things you're more likely to come to conclusions that are based on a much broad, uh, broad mm. uh, sense of experiences you've experienced because if you for example let's say live in one small town and you stay in that town forever your mm. view of the world is often skewed by the perception based on that town right let's say yeah, yeah. availability and, heuristic yeah stuff, and right? if you but if you go traveling and you meet different cultures and you meet different types of people there are very many there are many similarities between us but there's a lot of different sort of aspects that we don't even think about until we actually experience that hmm. and it might be like that that because they've experienced the exposure to so many different species to understand them maybe the experience behind that they've acquired ha allows them to understand it in more in the depth that uh usually wouldn't be available for yeah, yeah. the they same to... member of a species if they stayed on their own planet forever yeah able to in intuitively grasp stuff that's that's more alien um than you might think yeah yeah so uh, i just thought this this whole concept of being able to understand genetic code just like that is incredibly fascinating it's just so 
I don't know. I, it just feels to me that yeah. I mean, it's like we professionally expend massive effort to try and understand. To, to, these yeah, things. to understand those things, and yeah. you know, my current work and Rich's PhD work involves a lot of uh, trying to understand how cells work and looking through their genetic code, and it's just incredibly difficult. Yeah, time-consuming kind of a... work that we need to, and we still lack a lot of knowledge that can help mm. us to reach the point where we want, and it's still going to take a long time, whereas they, they are capable of doing that in them. It's so kind jealous. of a fantasy, right? <laughs> to have a, a perceptual organ that just lets you like look at genetics and understand what's going on just yeah. intuitively. I mean, yeah. honestly, if we had this, I mean, our science would skyrocket the speed of uh of like progress in, in science mm. would skyrocket so much people yeah. i think just to put in perspective for everyone and uh, to to all our listeners when we're talking about sequencing something let's say we have some cells that we are interested in sequencing mm-hmm. one run of such um sequencing even though nowadays it's still it's getting cheaper yeah. but still is worth enough to buy a small car just one run let's take several samples of from some tissue of interest and it's enough to buy you a car i'm not joking it's it's i it's, mean at this point it's kind of a second hand not particularly well at this point it's a car. second hand but still a car whereas yeah. for example yeah. um a few years back when i was first doing the sequencing uh, studies Mm-hmm. Um, it was a proper. You could buy a modern car, uh, oh, yeah, car with yeah. it. It's it's, yeah. and it's if you, just. If you want to use any slightly more esoteric method, that's not just like standard sequencing, something that's got going to give you some some you know, different information, then uh, that or that a tends more in depth be... understanding than yeah. just general sequencing. Yeah. It's oof. Hmm. Honestly, yeah, pricey. It's very pricey, but it's necessary because hmm. we need. And often, the more. And if those who are listening to us and are not into in science, um, bear in mind that the more questions we get answers for, the more questions we get. Yeah. So the one question and one answer can lead to more three questions, and then answer to one of those questions and to create more questions. And and the knowledge has a fractal go, geometry deeper we go it's the more difficult it gets to to get the because there's so many questions now it's not like you know 100 years ago when science was like basically after studying on the university for 10 years you could probably learn everything there was on the world right well not quite but well, not quite but still <laughs> there was a lot of people you know having such a broad knowledge about topics that they could discuss mm. anything but yep. because science was not so much in depth now yeah. if you wanted to do that now 100 i think there are some calculations i've read somewhere that 100 years ago the amount of knowledge that was produced that me produced now in minutes oh I'm yeah, talking yeah. In like a year the, time the amount of knowledge produced in the scientific literature per year is now like typically more than most of the rest of human history in a given year supposedly something yeah. like that and um, like math i read some it was about math specific, specifically that the amount of publications mathematical publications that were produced in the last i don't know 100 years like mm-hmm. in the last decade we've produced so much that per year we produced it's just the non mind number is mind-boggling yeah. So, and we're getting more and more questions and more ideas. And the more people there are, the more educated they are, the more questions they ask. And it's, it's just impossible. Knowledge, the science, like often when you read the books and you meet, like often introduce like omni potent beings that they under, they know everything, right? Our brains are incapable of knowing how much we don't know. Hmm. Okay, this is this is the concept that to all our listeners that you need to grasp is that you can't know er- like everything. It's just our brains, the structure of our brains, even though it's as much as some people have photogen- photographic memory that they can memorize everything they see hmm. or people who are, you know, genius people that can talk about abstract things, physicists, amazing scientists, physicists or artists who can imagine things that we've never you know, even thought about. All of those concepts. It's just a drop 
in a gigantic ocean that we yeah. cannot even see the end. We cannot even perceive where it is. So the, the the more you know, the more the more you're exposed to the limits of your own knowledge. Like I said, like knowledge has this fractal structure. So the as someone specializes in like a really narrow field, they end up being exposed to all of the other just adjacent, yes, also yes. really narrow fields, and each of the adjacent fields is like oh i could do my life's work in this adjacent field in like this super narrow area um and so you're surrounded by the limits of your own knowledge of the world so it tends to leave you with a sense of mm, i know nothing <laughs> this is like um a specific sort of um graph there's a great graph. I want to talk about two graphs that sort of represent the sort of no- knowing That's things. just the whole Dunning-Kruger thing. It's, is it the one that basically, at the beginning, you think you're an expert and then you suddenly realize you know very little and as big of time as you become knowing more about Tokyo, you sort of the graph grows a bit? Is that yeah, the one? Yeah, I think that's the one. Yeah. That, yeah. This is the first graph I want to talk about. It's like a beginning when you learn study about something and you realize, oh, I know quite a lot about it and your confidence, mm. you know, if you imagine the confidence uh, on the y-axis, so it's going up mm-hmm. and then the x-axis, the time we spend on a specific topic and then at some point you're very confident about, you know about something and then you realize the more you spend time on it, you realize how little you actually know because yeah. there are all many adjacent topics that actually feed into that specific topic. Mm-hmm. And then with time, you know, with constant reading and studying, you realize that, oh, actually, I know a bit. And you can call yourself an expert then, but you still never reach the same level of confidence that you initially know yeah. years, years back. Yeah. And that sort of reminded me, I think, of a graph from XYCD. XKCD. If I remember it. Yeah, yeah. XKCD, yeah. sorry. I think it was an XKCD. Yeah, that's definitely Where there was there. like the studying a graph where there was like in high school or primary school high school it's like a circle right you learn of everything ah, yeah, yeah. right if you imagine the spy hmm. like a circle of all the knowledge we ever produced right yep. and then in the very middle is the primary and high school right hmm. and then you go to university let's say and you specialize or you don't have to go to university you just specialize in something and your knowledge gains it. so it starts becoming a peak out of that little middle circle hmm. and sort of the phd sort of work right that's what the graph was relating to mm-hmm. is that is that you do a tiny little microscopic bump in that big circle mm-hmm. um, of knowledge, right? So you have the tiny big and the big of peak, peak that pushes that boundary a bit, and that's sort of what we were talking about. That little push, yeah, that tiny little nub on the edge of the knowledge, yeah. Well, it's and yet, what where you, expertise lies. Yeah. You know? Although somehow we 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 fail to generalize this lesson, right? because <laughs> we, we fail to learn from the experience of of like gaining expertise that we know almost nothing um that we should know that the fields in which we know very little we all we know even less than that but yet we still feel <laughs> yes. justified in like offering our opinions about these other things so it's like <laughs> for all listeners this is all our opinion there are People that probably will tell that we are idiots, or at least we have no idea what we're talking about. And probably they are correct. So just whatever you listen to, and this advice goes to everyone, take it with a grain of salt. Just just, just bear it out in your mind. I say it's worth pointing out that it's actually, it's difficult to do that. Because you know, there's, there's studies in cognitive psychology that basically show that when we hear stuff, we more or less accept that it's true. And then we have to expend yeah. energy to be skeptical about it so this is why it's very important to police your information diet for good quality inputs because you don't have the energy to be skeptical about everything (laughs) i think this is the problem when it comes to news as well because when you read news this is what often like the fake news you know a lot of appearing appearance of fake news is and people get overwhelmed so ideally what I think this is my, I think, op- ad- advice to, to the listeners. Maybe you don't agree with this, Richard, but a lot of scientific literature that we read as scientists, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of people think this is where if it's based on, if it's written peer reviewed, which it should be, but sometimes they're not because there's a lot of fake journals, mm-hmm. by the way, everyone. Um, there's a lot of fake journals that are there to scam scientists. Yeah. I know, it's, it's, it's bullshit, but it happens, part of my language. But, um, it's it happens even then sometimes of those publications that were peer reviewed are an absolute atrocious quality. 
So when you read them and you think and you know about the field, you realize how badly written or the study makes basically no progress or maybe just yeah, it's it's. It's not the best quality of study that we've um, I can't remember. What, it's given some nickname. Someone's Law, which basically states that 95% of everything is crap. And this is equally Probably as true. Probably Murphy's Law, uh, knowing uh, life. It's... Yeah, it's a slightly different thing. Uh, but uh, And this is as true of the peer-reviewed scientific literature as it is of anything else, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> So often, more often than not, we will provide. Well, I'm gonna. We will try to provide references to all of what we talk about, and the concept is that we we will try to put you, give you links to sources that we believe are the most scientifically factually uh, correct. So a lot of peer-reviewed, very high, res- highly respected book papers, such as Nature or anything that um um we know that we can trust because it's very strictly reviewed. Well, Although, saying that, I did give links to Wikipedia, which often is not reviewed by people, but it's a good start where you can sort of learn things. Yeah, so for the most part, uh, trying to actually read the original academic sources is... We'll try to give... I mean, usually Wikipedia is a very good start to give a base... um, basic knowledge hmm. because a lot of for the a lot of science we talk about a lot of the wikipedia um um uh, articles are really good oh yeah don't get me wrong they're written by actual scientists and um people sometimes. who actually read their sometimes but i remember actually you know doing one for, on some protein or something hmm. back in my university yeah and they were it was studied based on you know papers so they're oh, often yeah. good start but Look down on the references in those paper, in those articles. What reference they give? If they give none, then maybe try to find better. But the sources usually are relatively good. Mm, yeah, and ironically, sometimes the, there's a sort of sweet point of obscurity with Wikipedia, right? So if, if it's too obscure, it's just one guy's opinion. Um, if it's too common, then it's contested and disputed, and it's like politically, you know, there's there's fights going on between people. But if it's not so obscure that it's one dude, um, but it's in a it's obscure enough that most people aren't looking at it. Then it's usually done by people who kind of know what they're doing. Um, mm. so. so yeah, the conclusion of this is: take everything with a grain of salt, but trust the sources. Maybe that specialists give you, the experts give you. Well, you have maybe. like you have no choice there, right? You know, it's a, it's a yeah, you, you have to really you have, have to make choice, that gamble, I mean, right? It's a question yeah. of. Uh, picking out the like it's learning what the indicators are that someone has done a decent skeptical critical job of whatever their mm. work was you have to develop kind of a a heuristic for for well done science um which is tricky yeah i mean sorry i i, I top of, apologize to our listeners because we just spent 20 minutes talking about this yeah the conclusion is in this in in decisive conclusion but unfortunately that's the reality yeah, yeah. It's, we, perhaps we should wrap for up science wise science wise this tangent we will try to give you the best sources oh, okay yeah, yeah. we'll try our best right <laughs> Let's circle back <laughs> away. <laughs> Massive tangent. Let's uh, um, yeah. resume with, uh, with some final points on the book. Um, so, sure. uh, do you want to go into your predictions? Yes, let's do my predictions. Um, I think um, the next chapter, um, I think Lilith will finally get to know more about Daya and his and the capabilities of Onkali. And um, we will learn more about the technology, or what? What the, the, the there will be definitely something more about the technology because they discussed about the 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 species, but I think there will be more now on technology. And I think the chapter, the next chapter, will end with Lilith actually finally uh, being let to free. Okay, uh, how are you defining freedom? Well, I think I just imagine it like. Daya standing up and then the whole room just goes boo, down and then basically she's surrounded by I don't know like other beings like Daya and then the Onkali and then she just is led, led somewhere around the ship that's why I okay right so she's not released back on earth and 
left her. No, 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 no. I think yeah. before, because he said that he, you know, all the answers should be given if she's capable of walking around his species. Mm. So I assume still that she is somewhere on the ship with surrounded by the other beings. Mm-hmm. So I assume that's what's going to happen. I think, and the reason why I'm going doing this prediction, last prediction, is because. Richard spoiled me something, said that chapter 5 is actually much longer than chapter 3 and 4. So I think chapter 4 is just gonna be her finishing, and then chapter 5 is gonna be the big introduction to to what the uh, Onkali are and where she is. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I don't generally consider the length of chapters as overly spoilerific, but... Uh, yeah, but you know, it might be indicative of something. Yeah, it can it imply something about the narrative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I think we should wrap up in here and okay. um I would personally like to thank everyone who helped us to give us some feedback back. Absolutely. Uh, on the first episode. Um I hope that we improved on where we were lacking. Um I am going to get a new microphone soon, so my the voice quality will be better. So I hope next maybe not episode three, but episode four I'll sound more beautiful as Richard sound. So <laughs> I, you know, let's see. Um, and thank you for listening to our episode two. Thanks everyone. This has been the Xenothesis podcast. I've been Richard Acton and I'm Michael Glinka. You can find us on uh, m- almost any podcasting service now and uh, our website, uh, xenothesis.com. Yes, we are on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, and YouTube. Bye. Bye.